Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to the module 4 of this course. Today we will uh, look at image schema which is the part 1 of this module. So, a quick recap till now we have had 3 modules um, covered. Module 1 talked about the introduction to the course where we gave the background, the historical uh, uh, stories about how the uh, how this field came into being, the contribution of different contributing disciplines and so on and so forth. Then we started with the topics one by one. The first topic we looked at was categorization. The reason we looked at categorization in the very beginning is that this is a fundamental mental process which is at the core of many other mental processes. So, this is uh, the reason we looked at categorization first. So, categorization uh, covered all the theoretical aspects various kinds of uh, examples were also discussed, various uh, newer up, uh, developments, newer additions to the theories and so on were discussed and then we moved on to module 3, which was uh, the discussion of um, the domain of frame as to how the idea of frame builds up on the basic notion of feature based semantics. And then we saw that frames gives a better and bigger holistic picture to any kind of uh, categorization process, be it a simple mechanism, be it a simple object, a concrete object or a complex phenomenon or a, even an experience altogether and so on and so forth, how frames help us gives, gives a, give a structure to our experiences, events, people, objects and so on. So, this is frame basically took the idea of categorization, idea of organizing knowledge, worldly knowledge into uh, language because language is what we are worried about in this course. So, how language actually looks at how language takes us to the domain of the bigger picture, the gamut of all the information that is part and parcel of meaning as we, we understand meaning because we understand ideas situated in a contextualized fashion. So, that is what we talked about in terms of frame. So, now we will move on to a yet another take on this matter, yet another way of looking at um, the organization of knowledge, the um, schematization of knowledge and so on and so forth. So, roughly we will call this the image schema because in as far as language is concerned, this is the term that we use. However, there are uh, many other names there are this is called schema, the schemata theory, then there is also a name called script and so on and so forth. So, um, this is the, the history of schemata and schema theory is very long and the contribution of various disciplines have actually shaped to where it is now. So, like every other module we will have a, a road map to follow in this. So, as we see we will uh, first and foremost chart the history of schemata theory. Of course, this has to be also in brief uh, due to brevity of time uh, that, that itself makes a very interesting um, uh, understanding and uh, story in itself. And then uh, we will look at uh, the idea of schema or schemata from various uh, other disciplines apart from language. So, language is of course, our primary focus, but we will look at the philosophical underpinning, the, the contribution of psychology uh, as a discipline, cognitive psychology to be more precise and also the neural aspect of schema theory. And then after discussing these things, we will move on to the primary object of our um, uh, understanding uh, of our uh, study, which is 
language. So, how schema uh, is present in language, how we can backform from language structure to the underlying schematic uh, representation and so on. So, history. Now, the idea, the notion of a schema or a, uh, a, a kind of a graphic representation of event of, um, of a knowledge system is something very fundamental to cognitive psychology. This has been um, this has been studied, this has been discussed about, this has been written about and theorized for a very long time. And uh, this uh, and, and hence it makes, uh, makes it one of the fundamental notions. So, basically what it tries to do the schema theory what it tries to do is tries to explain how our uh, minds organize knowledge. So, see we are looking at uh, the knowledge system organization of knowledge system from the very beginning has to you know through categorization through frame and then through schema. So, uh, we have already seen that categories um, often fail and then um, there is a idea of uh, frame, but frame is kind of a detailed understanding. Frame means that you know you have uh, all the associated knowledge of with respect to one particular item. So, if I uh, talk about um, a college student, uh, just a, a simple word a college student, it is not simply you, you do not understand it in its um, in, in a vacuum, you understand it in a larger setup. But that is not what is schema. Schema basically refers to the skeletal um, uh, skeletal part of the entire idea, the entire experience. So, do we have a fundamental uh, you know uh, schematic image in our mind? How do we uh, go about uh, you know uh, understanding many things that are probably similar in, uh, sim in in experiential domain and so on? This is where schema theory comes from. So, how do we how does our mind organize various different kinds of um, experiences into uh, let us say small boxes like uh, you know um, let us say it is a file cabinet. So, you have you know a file cabinet has many many smaller uh, uh, drawers which has each of them can be called a schema let us say. So, there is a schema of um, uh, traveling from one place to another, there is a schema of um, going to an office or going to a college and so on and so forth. So, these are certain things certain kinds of experiences that probably has a uh, schematic uh, understanding schematic uh, underpinning. So, this is where it uh, basically takes us. So, but the fundamental notion is still the same. So, how do our minds organize uh, knowledge information and memory. It is very difficult to put them separately. So, I have put them as um, with, a, with a slash uh, they are not the same, but they are also not very different. So, they are intertwined. So, how do we go about um, you know the store knowledge and information and then uh, you know put it in memory and then we retrieve the same when we need to use it for a later purpose and so on. So, and which of course, when we use it, we use it for cognition and for behavior. So, behavior is the output that is visible, whether it is a linguistic behavior, verbal behavior right as is as I am uh, showing right now, but behavior can be many of many other types as well gesture for example, my gestures accompanying uh, my speech so on and so forth. So, various kinds of behavioral output and there are also action that is to be taken with respect to certain kind of a uh, scenario. For example, we, we uh, you know the schema for let us say um, the schema of um, coming face to face with a dangerous animal. So, there is a there is an action that is necessary on our part to take into account if we have to have the proper schema in place. So, this is what we mean by the knowledge the information about the so the knowledge about the understanding that you face an, an animal that is potentially dangerous to you. So, this is uh, your knowledge will depend on your information structure with respect to what that animal basically signifies, what it can do, what it does, what it has been doing and how the previous interactions between human and that animal has been. So, these will form the parts of the information structure that will eventually create your knowledge base on that particular event about that particular event and then it will be uh, it is understood to be stored in your long term memory. And then when you face with uh, you face a similar situation in a later uh, scenario or either literally or metaphorically then you are able to understand it make sense of the new scenario by uh, you know going back to the same schema and then then that will result in your behavior. So, this is why it is very important to understand the fundamentals of an event object or a scenario and this is where the idea of schema comes in. 
as I said in the beginning, there have been it is not the work of any one person or any one discipline. This has been this uh, field also the understanding of schema and schema theory has also been enriched by um, a number of uh, notable scholars from different disciplines, different um, fields within cognitive science. So, we have uh, philosophers, psychologists, neuroscientists and linguists all of them contributing. So, these are some of the notable names of course, there are some more, uh, uh, but these are the names that are uh, most commonly uh, cited. These are the people whose work uh, are commonly most commonly cited when we talk about the schema theory, the, the way how it uh, came into being. So, let us start with philosophy like uh, all the other domains that we have uh, done so far. Because this is the uh, one of the reason in this particular case is that the initial idea was given by philosopher Immanuel Kant. So, uh, let us go back a little bit and then uh, remember our um, uh, then let us refresh our memory in terms of the disembodied cognition versus the embodied cognition. But there we saw that disembodied cognition fails to understand many aspects, may fails to uh, negotiate many aspects of how language is learned and used and processed in real life. Similarly, many other processes. So, disembodied cognition and symbolic cognition with respect to language and its use has been uh, criticized at uh, many levels. So, we can kind of summarize that entire finding from a philosophical standpoint by looking at the later uh, philosophers. Some of them are I have mentioned here, but this is by no means uh, any an exhaustive list, but um, Pat Patricia Churchland, Maurice uh, Merleau-Ponty, John Dewey and many others have uh, significantly uh, you know, put forward their point and which has um, uh, you know, with, with a very severe criti critique of the uh, ontolo both ontological and epistemological dualism. Dualism has been of many kinds like Cartesian dualism that we talk about, it has had many facets. So, mind body dualism versus you know, mind matter dualism, subject object dualism and then cognition emotion. So, is it is cognition uh, devoid of emotion that is what you uh, know the, um, that is that kind of a duality of symbolic cognition and so on and so forth. So, knowledge imagination this kind of dualism that have been proposed by a particular section has been severely criticized by uh, many, uh, many other philosophers. So, theories from disembodied perspective of mind, motivation, value, reason have been seriously questioned by findings from later day psychological findings as well as we have already seen in the background in the module 1 that uh, when psychology um, uh, developed in the, uh, and it got a new branch of cognitive psychology with respect to various newer paradigms of research, newer experimental methodologies and um, a lot of new findings, empirical evidence and so on. Then the this kind this these um, this kind of dualism started getting questioned. So, not only from philosophy, but also from psychology as a result of which there were um, new questions to be talked about in new new ways of looking at how do we resolve this problem then. Of course, there is there is an embodied understanding and there is an abstract understanding. Let us uh, make one thing clear here, even though we say that disembodied cognition the, or the symbolic cognition, the proponents of symbolic cognition do always um, do uh, prefer a dualism between what is objective and what is subjective and the later day embodied cognition um, proponents have said that knowledge and cognition is primarily embodied. There is always this um, uh, basic agreement between these two schools of thought that even if even if the mind is embodied, even if cognition is embodied, we, series, we still cannot deny that there are certain abstract concepts, abstract notions, there are certain abstract and objective uh, uh, mechanisms that are of course, part of the mind's machinations. So, there is certainly an objective uh, domain and there is a subjective domain. The interaction is what the point of uh, bone of contention in this case is. So, on the one hand uh, symbolic cognition says that there is hardly any uh, you know relationship, the embodied cognition uh, hypothesis says there is a relationship. Now, the problem after the philosophers like Marleau Ponty have have, um, uh, have criticized heavily the and uh, the disembodied cognition group. Now, the question is ok, uh, if that this is embodied, if the mind is embodied, cognition is embodied, then how do we arrive at reason and cognition through an embodied understanding? What is the connection? 
So, there is an embodied sensory motor experience that, that informs that modulates our understanding, but and then how do we go from there to the objective, how do we go from the um, lived experiences to the abstract understanding of it, because understanding has to be the fundamental understanding cannot be always um, it can be informed by, but there is an abstract uh, manifestation representation. So, where how do we arrive at that? So, if the mind is embodied, how is it capable of abstract thoughts? This has been the question that philosophers have asked. Um, uh, this is of course, I, uh, we are kind of simplifying the idea, this is not as simple as I am telling you, uh, this there has been you know uh, many, many arguments and uh, disagreements and controversies on this, but roughly this is the idea. So, the question that uh, later philosophers are faced with is that from going from sensory motor capacities to abstract thinking, what is the pathway, how do we arrive there, this is a philosophical question. One of the philosophers who tried to answer this is Immanuel Kant. Immanuel Kant looks at this issue very carefully in his Critic of Pure Reason, where he talks about a third entity, a kind of a connecting link, sort of a missing link, sort of a a uh, link that connects the abstract and the lived, uh, the, the higher the, the objective and the subjective. And this third thing is kind of a uh, sort of a schema. So, this is and how is it structured, how is it uh, you know what is it, what is the nature of this particular third element. This is uh, what is he says is a procedure of imagination, he calls it a procedure of imagination that structures images in accordance with the concept, this is the fundamental aspect. So, on the one hand you have concept at the at the abstract level, so this is um, let us say concept and at the um, lived experience level at the embodied level you have the experiences and here there is imagination that plays a very important role to abstract to kind of um, uh, to, to, to take out the fundamental uh, parts of that particular experience that is uh, and creates a kind of an imagination uh, in, uh, creates a kind of a picture that that sort of is in accordance with the concept even though it does not have the fleshed out look of the concept. This is roughly what um, uh, he, he talks about. So, it is neither the concept itself nor the actual instance. So, it is the let us say the concept of a dog for example. So, the in between the imaginary uh, abstraction uh, imagination uh, the abstraction through imagination of a dog is neither the entire gamut of information about being a four legged animal you know the, the behavior of a dog and what all it can you know the loyalty aspect of dog, the furry aspect of the animal, the other other um, uh, you know aspect that it works on four legs, it works its tail and so on and so forth that is the concept that is the entire gamut of information. But what the and this is but this is not what uh, Immanuel Kant is talking about, he is also not talking about a particular dog and your own experience with that dog. So, this is this is where the idea comes in. So, you abstract certain fundamental ideas of that. This um, of course, he fleshes this out in many um, in, in, in great detail in his in his work. However, many of his ideas were later uh, criticized because uh, on the one hand um, the one particular aspect of criticism was that Immanuel Kant in spite of his um, support for embodied hypothesis embodiment uh, as a serious um, domain to a look at uh, in terms of knowledge generation still kept the form and uh, you know uh, the form and the concept separate. There was still a very different um, the dualism was still maintained in a very strict sense albeit with a, a connecting link. But later philosophers do not always agree and they say that there, there is more of fluid uh, give and take, there is a more of connection between these two domains. But what has uh, remained um, favorable, what the idea of the basic idea however, has remained favorable. The recognition that there is a form giving schematizing role of human imagination. So, it is like uh, there is a there is a, a contribution of the human imagination that can create a schematic representation of a particular experience. This is the fundamental takeaway that has found support in the later philosophers, later uh, even psychologists and linguists and so on and so forth. So, that understanding that it is the human imagination that is the locus of meaning, thought and judgment. 
So, this particular aspect has been um, uh, has been has has still kept been carried forward. Now, let us look on uh, go ahead to the domain of psychology. Kant ideas were um, later on, later on uh, taken up by Piaget and uh, he he, uh, propo he actually was one among the first to use the word schema. Uh, in his 1923 book, he talk, he uh, basically introduces this idea of a schema that underlies our understanding. So, he this is um, and I quote from his book a cohesive repeatable action sequence. He gives it a better um, a much more formulated um, uh, uh, structured way of looking at it. So, basically what it is, what is a schema? A schema that underlies our understanding and which is a cohesive repeatable action sequence. So, many of our actions, many of our day to day um, you know, lived experiences are a recurring pattern. This is what Piaget is talking about. So, uh, possessing components component actions that are tightly interconnected and governed by a core meaning. So, there are many actions which are repetitive in nature, which the humans typically uh, go through in their life in many manifestations. So, there are certain actions, actions in terms of you know sequences. So, let us say the, an action of going from one place to another. This is a fun, this is a very simple kind of an action. So, I might move from uh, in this part point of the room to that part of the room or I can move from this building to another building. Similarly, I can move to uh, you know one city to another and so on and so forth. I can also go from being very happy to being very sad uh, within a matter of um, uh, a few moments uh, provided I you know uh, somebody tells me a sad uh, incident or something. So, these all are uh, whether it is a mental state or a physical change of you know place, physical locomotion of a particular agent and so on, you see there is a recurring pattern of the same type of sequential actions. So, we start, so we, if we move from point A to point B, what it means is that there is a starting point and then there are in between intermittent points through which we finally, arrive at a final point. So, this is the sequence of repeatable sequence of events that is typically part of uh, various kinds of experiences. So, this is just one of them. So, this is a cohesive, this structure remains kind of constant with minor modifications here and there. And so, the core meaning remains that I move. So, x goes from point A to point B, this is the core meaning. So, that, that point A to point B might be a physical location in terms of spatial location or it can be a mental state as later on have been utilized. So, this is what uh, Piaget talks about when he, tries, when he gives an explanation as to what a schema is. Later, um, another important person whose contribution um, has been also very, very significant in this domain is the uh, uh, psychologist Frederick Butler. He also says that this is an unconscious mental structure that each individual carries in the, within his or her mind. So, this is an unconscious structure that is already there. So, uh, notice that psychologists talk about a structure. On the other hand, philosophers uh, like Immanuel Kant talks about an imaginative and, and a particular level of imagination where the human abstracts the notions. So, here there is a, a clearer picture emerging when um, uh, by 1930s in the in the in the 1930s and active organization of past experiences this is very crucial he actually gives it in um, in in words so there is a schematic representation a mental structure of an event which has been built up through various past experiences of the individual so each individual now this because of his focus on the individual he also gives an uh, gives an angle uh, which was um, uh, which is very very interesting actually that individual each individual might have slightly different uh, schematic representation of the same event. Of course, there are fundamental um, uh, schemas that are universal, but an individual's understanding of the thing might be different. So, depending on the experiences, past experiences, the schema is created, and it creates a generic knowledge about things and events. So, basically, you can generalize, like I just said. So, one can generalize going from one point to another simply by saying that um, you know, there is a schematic representation which is a letter which we called source path goal SPG schema which we will look about it in a, in a, in a while. 
but this is what happens. So, over a period of time your past experiences has shaped an understanding a generic idea of movement of one object across space and then this creates a core meaning of that particular experience. And then what happens is that when you have new information coming in, so you are basically is, it is understood through this schema of old information. The schema is already there and the new information comes in and we kind of try to understand this with respect to the uh, existing schema. And of course, there are uh, he goes on to talk about his uh, the, his work in various languages that he has uh, worked on, um, but we will uh, leave it at that. And then in the uh, after after 1930s, then as we have discussed bef uh, before, that behaviorism was the most uh, important theoretical um, uh, was most uh, most uh, powerful uh, theoretical point at that time, and which of course as a result of which this understanding schema theories and all did not find favor with behaviorism and gradually after a period of time this was um, kind of uh, fading away. So, for some time it was not uh, there was not much of uh, uh, consideration on this as not in the not the way it later on came back. So, after a while in the 70s Marvin Minsky uh, uh, we have talked about Marvin Minsky before. So, Marvin Minsky and um, uh, David uh, Rumillard are credited with the revival of this schema theory in the 70s. So, after a brief period because in the in the intervening years behaviorism was holding sway and then we saw that in the 50s and 60s onwards when behaviorism was very strictly criti uh, criticized and then cognitivism and um, innateness and all, all those ideas came back again and so, so did the idea of schema. So, Rume in, in fact, uh, Marvin Minsky and uh, Rumenhal's contribution are uh, contributions have been very significant um, in Rumenhal to the extent that Rumenhal actually considers schema as the building block of cognition. So, we understand everything knowledge is based on the smaller building blocks of schema. So, larger amount of knowledge can be you know boiled down to smaller schemas and that is how we store the information. So, this is why it has been given a lot of importance by um, many pe many people uh, later on. So, um, also also important is the contribution of um, Abelson and Shank under uh, 1970s, where they called this understanding a script. They give it, give it a different name. Script script is largely abstract. It doesn't have um, it, it is largely abstract. So, a large amount of knowledge in our brain is structured at around routine experiences. So, even the 70s also the same ideas are carried forward that large amount of our activities are recurring patterns of interaction between an organism and its environment. This is the fundamental aspect. So, as it was in the 1930s, um, the 20s, 20s and 30s like Piaget and um, uh, um, uh, others and then uh, even at the in the 70s the same idea was getting um, you know carried forward that large a large chunk of our experiences are actually repetitive and this is this is what remains um, that is the, which holds even today that because of this sequential temporal sequence of various events or many other kinds of activities they, they are repetitive and hence this can create something like a script. So, uh, one, of, one of the important um, uh, one of the um, uh, uh, interesting uh, scripts that we that has been referred to in many textbooks is the restaurant going to restaurant script. So, going to restaurant has a, a kind of a sequential uh, nature of various things happening one after another in that particular order. In the, uh, for example, you enter the enter the restaurant, you will be greeted by the person at the gate. Uh, in these uh, these days, they also ask for your mobile number invariably. And then, uh, if you are unlucky enough, that the restaurant will have a dress code which obviously don't match with yours. Sometimes they might match, and then there are many other activities like going getting a seat and so on and so forth. So, largely they remain the same wherever whichever restaurant you go to these things remain same. So, this is the script that um, Abelson and uh, et al talk about. So, these are and later on Gibbs and Colston also gives um, um, uh, also talk about the same thing. So, they call it experiential gestalt. So, overall the, uh, the entire uh, experiential understanding of a particular event is what is the schema. 
that is at the which underlies thought and language. So, we understand we, we uh, cognize an event because we understand it as a sequence of repetitive um, uh, events. So, which means to all of these the findings of all of these psychologists basically refer to the same point that schemas are psychologically real, it is not something we are making up. This is psychologically real for example, um, this is yet another very commonly cited example of the schema of a Japanese girl let us say. So, what, what do you immediate what is the schema in your mind of a Japanese girl? Now, for a person who has never met a Japanese girl, who has never watched Japanese films, who has absolutely no idea about Japanese culture, costume, food or anything, will have a very, very limited um, understanding of the uh, concept of Japanese girl. So, it will probably include a kimono and a particular hairstyle that you see in books and that is it, you do not know much and you will create your uh, schema around that. As you gradually let us say now you, uh, you know uh, the same person goes on to meet some Japanese people in his life later on and gets to experience Japanese food and so on and so forth and then the schema gets further uh, enhanced and then you accordingly change. So, this is a, this is what we this is how schemas are created. Now, one individual might have a different experience from another person. So, their individual schemas might differ. So, this is where we talked about a uh, little while ago about the individual differences uh, that Butler talked about that also it comes in. However, uh, there are also disagreements um, though largely psychologists agree that the schema are uh, created out of our experiential domain, out of the typically recurring sequential patterns of experience. However, how these things are um, represented in the brain or are they represented in the, in the brain at all or are they created on the go, there are many such um, uh, disagreements that, uh, that are also there. So, for example, Gibbs, uh, Gibbs and Colston do not uh, really agree that there is an explicit abstract representation of the same. They have always, um, they have in many of their papers, they have highlighted this that of course, there is a schema, but probably it is uh, not a good idea to look for a permanent explicit mental representation of the same. So, they, uh, they argue the point of argument of Gibbs and Colston is that, that this, this gestalt, these gestalt, uh, these schemas arise momentarily during the interaction, when brain, body and the world interacts that is when the schema arises. So, there are all these um, uh, finer nuances which of course, uh, we cannot get into for the brevity of time. So, let us quickly now move on to our main, uh, 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 main, main point here which is language. So, we have already seen that with respect to uh, philosophy, with respect to psychology, there is a lot of support that talks about understanding the world through a kind of a schematic representation in our mind. So, there is a schematic representation that can take care of. So, one schema can take care of various manifestations of similar kind of uh, experiences. So, we have many schemas for different kinds of experiences. So, this this much more or less everyone agrees upon. Now, when it comes to language studies, when it comes to the role of schema in language, one of the first um, one of the first scholars to look into it was Len Talmi. Len Talmi's work is, um, is phenomenal, he has his contribution is extremely important in terms of understanding spatial language, which we will look into in greater detail later. Uh, we, it needs a separate segment on its own. So, uh, Len Talmi and Ronald Langacker's work showed they were working independently of each other, but they showed uh, the same thing that closely connected languages may vary significantly in the meaning of spatial terms. What it means is that as I said Len Talmi's work primarily is in the domain of spatial language. So, how do we talk about let us say the bottle um, you know swam into the cave he walked out of the room, I exited the room and you know he uh, I am going to the kitchen, he has gone the child go went into the um, into the uh, garden and so on and so forth. So, there are various ways of talking about a movement of object in space. So, motion verbs basically they are they are the domain of motion verbs. So, how human locomotion or any other kinds of movements of objects, how do we define them, how does how does a language um, talk about it, how does it describe it. 
So, special terms in very many languages are actually different. So, it is perfectly fine to uh, say in English he slithered away. Now, this is not just something that a person just moved, there is a whole range of information that is part of that particular word slithering. Similarly, you can also say he exited, simply he exited. Now, these are uh, and then there are, these are various kinds of ways you can uh, in which spatial terms in language can be manifested. Now, what Talmi found out was that across the world's languages there is a lot of variation in the way we talk about spatial language, in the way we use spatial language. There is a lot of variation, languages differ in the choice of the words, in the way the structures are created and so on and so forth. But the crucial point however, is that in spite of all those differences, the terms all the languages that in, uh, all the languages use, all the different kinds of languages use, they can all be un analyzed in terms of certain universal schemas. For example, that is something an important schema of movement includes the path information, there is a path that I went, I went into the room which means which signifies that the movement of the agent has been towards the inside of the goal. So, this is the path information. Similarly, bounded regions, bounded versus unbounded whether it is a field or it, whether it is a room. So, the moment you say I went into the room, you specify that the goal is a bounded uh, entity. It has a it has a boundary which has an inside and has an outside. Similarly, there is something called a contact. So, let us say um, an object is on. So, there is there is a computer on the table. So, the table and the, ob the uh, and the computer are in contact with each other and there is a particular arrangement of those objects. Then there is force and so on they go on to list various universal schema that can underlie all the differences, all the different manifestations of various kinds of spatial terms in any, any language that you take. So, for example, the English on simply the preposition on has the schema of above contact and support. The moment you say x is on y, the bottle is on the table, there uh, you have to understand these are these are the schematic representation. So, it is something like uh, this is a table and this is a let us say a glass bottle, uh, there is a glass on the table. and this is the table. So, this is above it, this is the orientation part that is taken care of, there is a contact that is important in order to talk about in order to be you know in order to use the word on, if there is no contact English will prefer the word above. So, the moment, moment you have used on that means, this configuration is uh, has to be satisfied that it is uh, 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 this is above one is above another and then there is a contact and there is a support element in the picture as well. So, this is what Talmi primarily means that in another language you might have a different way of expressing it, but this kind of configurations will be uh, part of that as well. So, Basically, he talks about three kinds of schemas that all these um, all, all these possibilities can ultimately be um, con we ultimately can converge upon. So, there is a topological um, aspect to it, there is orientational aspect and there is a force dynamic aspect. So, what is topological aspect? Topological aspect is the uh, relative nearness like on above and so on the kind of arrangement that you have. Orientational uh, aspect is typically with respect to the um, relative to the body orientation. So, we typically talk about things being above and below and you know to the right to the left uh, in front of behind and so on and so forth. So, these are more often than not dependent on the bodily orientation which we sometimes um, superimpose on another object and uh, which by which we give rise to different kinds of frames of reference which we will see later. And then there is also a third type of um, uh, image schema, third kind of image schema which is dependent on force on the he calls it force dynamics. So, force dynamics also is very, very important and crucial um, uh, type of crucial, crucial category of schema. So, largely most of the schemas uh, we image schemas with respect to motion verbs talk about uh, with respect to spatial uh, terms uh, will fall into 
uh, any of these three or sometimes a combination of many of these. So, this is the background. So, by 90s, uh, 1980s research from many different domains converged on the idea of image schema and so there was an agreement by 1980s the agreement was there that there is uh, this kind of so language psychology philosophy all everybody agreed that there is an there is something called a schematic representation in the brain which arises out of the um, experiential um, experiences of the uh, of people and then um, it, it also helps us understand language and then there is a connection to language and thought now, uh, different kinds of origin were suggested for the same. So, fine we have this, but how does it originate? One is of course, that everybody talks about is that recurring bodily experience, which John Johnson and uh, uh, his colleague also agrees. Johnson's work has been seminal again in this area. So, we are uh, talking about only him, even though everybody has talked about the same thing. So, Johnson and his colleagues will uh, say that the origin where it starts from is the bodily experiences that is fine. Uh, but on the other hand, there are other people who say that human brain is structured. So, so if the human brain had no capacity to create such abstractions out of the experiences, then it will not be possible. Now, it, it is important to remember that both of these can be correct at the same time. It is not that they are um, you know, mutually exclusive. So, if we, on the one hand human brain is capable of abstracting that kind of a schematic understanding from various you know recurring pattern of physical experiences and get, give it a schematic understanding. So, Johnson again is a, a very important um, uh, a scholar in this domain. So, Johnson and Lakoff, George Lakoff, um, they popularized the idea that the term called image schema. So, so far we were talking about only a schema or a schema or uh, schemata or script. When it comes to language, the scholars in language they talk about image schema. So, they have popularized the term image schema to underline the same bodily and sensory nature of the structure of conceptualization. So, this is now getting a little more. Um, a clearer with respect to. So, this is an image uh, as if it is an it is a kind of an image, it is a schematic image where which underlies all the bodily and sensory experiences and which is which also gives a structure to the conceptualization. Like I said all kinds of movements uh, can be understood through a simple schema of source, path and goal. So, there is a source, there is a path and there is an ultimate uh, goal to attain uh, by going through a particular path. However, Johnson's idea ref, um, slightly differ from that of his er, that of the earlier uh, uh, scholars. So, as far as um, Immanuel Kant is concerned, they, they, they do not agree that it is a purely form making capacity. Similarly, they also do not agree with Abelson's understanding that it is a, a mere uh, you know abstract knowledge structure. So, there are differences. However, the basic understanding remains the same. So, this image schema arises out of recurring experiences and is used to make sense of the experience and reason about it and also can be used to structure abstract notions and even metaphors. So, this is very important because uh, so far we have seen that schemas are at the core of experiences which are created out of the recurring pattern and then we use the same schema to understand a new experience, a novel in a, a scenario. And then not only we use it in language in, uh, in the real term, but also in to understand uh, abstract notions and sometimes even metaphorical um, understanding of scenario. And then uh, let us move on to the neural grounding of image schema. Like we said in the beginning that there are two um, sources that have been proposed. One of them is the brain mechanism that the brain is uh, capable of creating this. So, Recent findings from neuroscience research has revealed that the brain areas that were thought to be primarily dedicated to other functions, other functions apart from language. So, like uh, sensory, more sensory motor areas and so on, they have been found to be active, uh, you know, they have been found to be um, uh, busy while doing even a language processing task. This has been a remarkable finding in last few decades that the brain areas uh, that are active when we are uh, when we are carrying out a language task is not only uh, the language areas that we already know that there are Broca's area and Wernicke's Wernicke's area and so on. So language areas are of course getting activated, but simultaneously we also activate many other brain regions even when 
uh, processing a very simple uh, sentence. So, we are activating the sensory motor domains as well. This remarkable finding actually takes us to understanding schematic representation in the brain in a better way. So, in other words language processing includes processes of spatial, visual and mental imagery. This is what uh, latest research has shown. So, the in this domain the, uh, the, the work of Regier proposed that spatial relations primitive which uh, Talmi talked about are a result of brain structure as to how the neural network actually makes connections between the uh, what it is called and how it is structured, what is the you know what is the alignment of various objects, various uh, um, uh, points in that structure is what how the brain looks at it. So, this is what um, he, do, he did in a very simple uh, this is a very simplistic representation of what Regier did. He proposed that spatial relations terms can be learned as different complex combination of primitives. It is not that if we just train the computer to look at various kinds of spatial relations with some primitives as to exact the, uh, the, the kind of primitives that Talmi talked about. So, it can be a path, it can be a connection, it can be a force and so on. The, if you if you train a system, if you train a computer to learn uh, those spatial terms through these primitives, the computer can, the program can generate um, names for novel scenario as well. So, how did he show that? He showed this by creating a computer program that could learn a wide variety of spatial relations from labeled scenes. Basically, he emul the program emulated a child learning. Uh, you know spatial terms looking at objects, looking at you know a simple geometric scene and then told the word that describes. Often we show a child like this is a uh, you know this bottle is on the table. So, what the child sees is, is a particular kind of an arrangement. So, something like this the notion of above. So, there is um, this is what this is called landmark L m is for landmark and this is for trajectory. So, uh, the trajectory is the object that is understood or looked at or conceptualized with respect to the landmark. So, the bigger object is the landmark, smaller object is the trajectory. So, one well, with respect to another. So, the car is in front of the building. So, the car is the trajectory, the lab building is a landmark and so on. So, we understand um, tra uh, trajectory with respect to the landmark. So, in this case, this is the arrangement between the uh, trajectory and the landmark and this is what the name is given. So, above see there is it is not touching. So, the above is slightly. So, this is the arrangement of these two of, the, of these two things with these two primitives trajectory and landmark are primitives and this is how a child would look. Child will look at two, sim two simple uh, geometric scenes and then be told that this is the name. He, he used the same pattern to, uh, to train the computer. So, in his program perceptual um, mechanism was um, were modeled on the basis of two main classes just like here. So, this is an orientational, this is above, this is above the, the orientation of verticality is used here and then topological feature like contact. So, in this case it is minus contact, there is no contact. So, he utilized these two um, uh, classes of uh, visual feature and then had various arrangements and the, uh, he had many subjects, people from many languages uh, came and looked at those objects and gave and spelled out what it is and the computer started and it learned and gradually it will it received many such inputs from various languages and ultimately learned the spatial conceptual systems and their names. And then the system the model was um, exposed to new configurations, newer novel ideas, novel uh, configurations of objects uh, and the spatial arrangements and the system gave out the uh, correct. So, on there was an input data and there was the training data and then there was a test um, data on which the model was tested and the model successfully gave out all the names. So, this basically uh, his work uh, uh, was one of the initial works that showed that the meaning of a given spatial relation word involves not only a word, but a complex a combination of primitive schema. So, we understand these things and we um, store that information through that schematic understanding. Uh, and that schematic understanding involves two primary visual schemas, one is that of orientation, another is that of topology. So, this is how the background stands, this is how the contribution of uh, scholars from different domains have shaped the idea of what is an image schema, how image schemas 
probably come into being, how it actually is understood, how the brain probably represents it and so on and so forth in a, in a, in a, in a rather uh, brief uh, format. So, now let us uh, go about, so how do we define image schema now as of now, to, as of today how what it is. So, a textbook example will be like this, a dynamic uh, um, an image schema is a dynamic recurring pattern of perceptual interactions and motor programs. These two are very, very significant aspects. So, this is a pattern, a dynamic because it is constantly evolving. So, we basically in get more and more input and uh, get, uh, get it enriched, but it is a recurring pattern. The uh, fundamental pattern is recurring that involves perceptual interaction. So, we know what to do with it and, the, and then the actual action. So, the motor program that um, is part of that uh, schema, that part of that experience and the perceptual interactions. Sometimes uh, of late image schema and uh, frames have also been uh, kind of understood to be related. So, for example, frames are often understood as a fleshed out um, uh, look, fleshed out um, aspect of image schema. So, image schema is the skeletal under structure of the uh, of the frames that is also another take that has been uh, given. So, basically it deals with physical relation, motion and perception. This is a dynamic analog representation of spatial relations and movements and so on. This is something we have already seen, uh, this is the definitional, as these are the definitional aspects as it stands today. So, these are Im imagistic in nature. Uh, because and it is schematic. So, for example, if we talk about um, we have been talking about movement. So, let us say there is a source and there is a path and there is a goal. So, this is the uh, image schema of source path and goal which is at the root of our understanding our recurring pattern of movements whether of ourselves or of others or of objects across space and so on. So, a lot of um, experiences can be uh, clubbed together through understanding through this understanding through this uh, image schema of source path goal. So, you see this is image is very very skeletal and this is um, very schematic it has no detail whether you see trees on the way or you see meadows on the way or nothing of that sort is necessary. Uh, but that, that is where frames will come into being. So, the frame of you know um, going for a long drive, it still utilizes the same image schema that there is a source and that and there is a path, but the path is more important here. But then in that case, you will also have other information that is part of the frame. So, the, the environment, the, the kind of you know music you might listen to and so on and so forth. But at the very core of that experience, that schematic representation is only this. So, all you need is a source, there is a goal and there is a path. So, this is what we mean by a very schematic and uh, non-detailed uh, look at. So, this is something I have already talked about. So, there is uh, there are types of image schemas. Uh, there is perceptual and there is the orientational and there is of course, the force dynamics. So, perceptual um, image schemas primarily refer to the simple structures that recur in our everyday bodily experience. So, sometimes there is container image schema, we will see each of them uh, in a shortly. So, there is the idea of containment, one thing containing another. So, I have you know this room has many tables and chairs. Um, uh, Similarly, the you know we are we, we are inside a building and the uh, uh, many such other configurations. Similarly, we also understand things of like you know emotions are in the heart. You know I have anger in my uh, you know my mind has memories, uh, so much so on and so forth. So one thing containing another. Similarly, uh, we have the idea of paths and links and balance and so on. So perceptual understanding of. Uh, various experiences can be grouped together in the type called perceptual type. And then there is uh, various kinds of orientation and relation like front back um, uh, apart whole center periphery and so on. Orientational metaphor, orientational image schemas are at the root of various metaphors that are dependent on orientation like prices go up, you know I feel down and so on and so forth. And then of course, as we said force dynamics is yet another uh, type of image schema that creates all uh, that that can take take care of various kinds of recurring experiences. And uh, now when we talk about schemas individually, we have to look at three uh, aspects 
of animate schema. Each schema has three uh, primary aspects, one is called the structural element, then there is a logic and there is a perceptual experience. Why do we talk about uh, perceptual experience? Because we are looking at this entire issue from the perspective of embodied cognition, how lived experiences. So, lived experiences are the basis of creating image schema, that is why perceptual experience needs to be talked about. And then logic of course, there is a logic because we how do we you know what is logic here? Logic is how we actually connect different experiences through one schema and put them in one category that is the logic. And then the structural elements. So, uh, for example, in the word in uh, it activates the container schema. So, when you say that um, you know there is um, there is um, uh, the office the research and development um, section is in the uh, administrative building. So, this is something like administrative building is a larger entity which houses the research and development section. So, this is inside one is in another. So, this is a container which has a boundary and within that boundary the second object. So, the uh, R and D office is within the boundary of the um, administrative building and so on and so forth. So, this is what is called a container image schema. So, this activates this so, every time in English language we talk about we use the preposition in we activate the container schema and which includes the aspects of the containing with specific affordance. Affordance basically means about what are the things that can be that are doable we talked about affordance before. So, like you know containing it like having a boundary having an inside and outside and so on and so forth. So, this is the uh, way we will look at the some of the common image schemas. So, the container image schema is perhaps the one of the most commonly utilized image schema I have been talking about it uh, already. So, this the structural elements are like interior, exterior and boundary. So, there is a there is a uh, no there is a boundary it is a bounded entity the moment it is a bounded entity there will be an interior and there is an exterior. So, x can contain y. So, this is the structural uh, aspect of it and the basic logic for this schema is that everything is either inside or outside a container. So, if a is inside b and b is inside c then a is inside c and so on. So, logic similarly I can say I have a uh, you know, coin in my hand then I put the coin in my purse and then the purse went inside the bag and the bag then went into the uh, you know uh, in, into the car and so on and so forth. So, this the logic remains the same. So, x is inside y and then that thing goes inside another thing. So, in all cases we are basically formulating the same kind of schematic representation to uh, that satisfies the word in in every of every of those uh, uh, instances of that sentence. So, every time we put something inside another we can use in. So, that is the basic logic of this schema and how do we come at this schema, how do we arrive at this simple schema uh, that that is because we have we have we experience this containment the idea of containment all through our life. How we have bodies that are bodies it bodies our physical body itself can be thought of as a container it has all the vital organs and all the processes that are inside it and so on and so forth. Secondly, we function within larger objects like buildings, rooms, forests etcetera. So, not only the body itself is fill it is like a fill container, it also is contained by other objects and more and more superimposed categories can be thought of. So, basically containment the idea of containment is a fundamental lived experience which gives rise to the container image schema. Similarly, source path goal I have been giving example of source path goal as well often you will see source path goal is written as SPG in many textbooks they use uh, SPG image schema. So, as, as uh, we have seen this has a source it has a path and it has a goal and of course, there is a, a direction. Now, the bodily experience that motivates this schema is our movement space again a very a very uh, human personal experience of movement in space. So, moving from one place to another along a continuous uh, sequence of continuous location. So, this is what movement all about is. So, the basic logic again there is a logic as to why uh, why we can connect how we connect various kinds of instances of movement within one schema this is what logic is all about. So, you see if A moves from uh, you know if one moves from A to B and then it passes through all the intermittent points then this this, this satisfies the SPG schema. So, various kinds of movements can be uh, grouped together under this schema. Similarly, there is a schema of link. 
So, bodily experiences again there are various kinds of uh, links. So, uh, so on and so forth and then there is of course, center periphery, center periphery we have already seen in metaphor. Uh, we will look at metaphor also metaphor relationship with uh, of image schema with metaphor. Uh, so, this is uh, yet another center periphery uh, simple to understand part whole uh, understanding of uh, schematic understanding also we have seen trajectory uh, landmark we have just seen. So, two entities uh, in which one is being described relative to another is the trajectory uh, trajectory landmark uh, 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 image schema. So, we experience ourselves and our surroundings in relative terms. So, right now I am in this room, I after after some time I might be outside the room, I might be standing in front of a building and so on and so forth. So, this is at a very basic personal human uh, lived experience and then this is an asymmetric uh, relationship. So, trajectory I, we always talk about the trajectory in terms of the landmark and not the other way around. So, there is a the ceiling fan is um, is hanging from the ceiling, but we never say the ceiling is above the fan like that. So, this is an asymmetric relation uh, asymmetric relationship and um, then comes the force dynamics. Force dynamics as uh, we were talking about a large number of image schemas are centered around the idea of force, force dynamics as in one thing exerting force or pressure on another. So, many aspects of language in fact, a lot of emotional language, language that describes emotion the, the metaphors that talk about emotion of various kinds can be understood in terms of force dynamics. So, what is basically force dynamics is this uh, it should be I should be having a. Uh. So, there is this schematically speaking the force dynamics will look like this. So, there is a cause of motion there is so let us say this is self and then this is a force this is agonist and this is antagonist. Now, the tendency the, the default tendency of the self of the person of anything is to be at the rest position. Now, if the, the uh, if the force from the antagonist is strong enough then we will have one kind of uh, reaction if there is and if we can uh, you know still contain the if we still manage to uh, uh, retain balance then we will be having different kinds of uh, uh, um, output in terms of emotion. So, self has emotion and then the rational self uh, the graph here has gone a bit uh, wonky. So, for self force tendency and then the force tendency of emotion. So, this is the self and its, for its tendency is to be balanced, its tendency is to be stable, but this one tries to imbalance you, the emotion tries to imbalance you and then the emotional response. So, as a result of this let us say somebody comes and fights with you early in the morning and depending on uh, and your uh, tendency is to remain balanced the, 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 the fight the uh, all the quarrel disturbs your mental balance and then you become sad or and there can be another response the force resists the temptations of you know getting into the grip of sadness throughout the day. So, you remain balanced. So, this is how various kinds of emotions can be understood. So, this is agonist which is inactive the rest position the self is always in rest position antagonist is the active force. So, something happens to you somebody says something to you. So, the emotion that it generates exerts pressure on the self and then as a result of this a force interaction the, the ideal condition is balanced, but when there is balance uh, uh, when it is off balance we have various kinds of and various kinds of um, uh, uh, emotion language like this he was gripped by emotion. So, this is something a very common way of understanding how one can not come out of you know how you are dealing with emotions. Um, so, this is uh, this is this is how it happens. So, there are two opponents in this interaction that is the opponent one is, one is the rational self, the opponent two is the emotion trying to throw the self off balance and this leads to the metaphor above. Now, because the passive objects in this case of a strong met mental force is helpless in this case the, the, the agonist could not fight back as a result of which the emotion has gripped the person. So, the emotion in this case the antagonist in this case has exerted its force and that is the force dynamic uh, understanding of it. So, emotion has 
has larger you know has an upper hand in this case and the self is under its control. When this is the image schema that, uh, that that is the force dynamics image schema that we use to understand a particular mental scenario, this is how we express it through language. He was gripped by emotion, you could the person could not shake off the, the, the force of the, uh, of the of the emotion at that particular case, it can be any kind of emotion. So, there are various kinds of uh, forces that are utilized, but the fundamental understanding remains the same antagonist agonist versus antagonist and creating force creating exerting uh, forces on each other and the resultant um, outcome so, but they can be of various types so gravitational force when we use gravitational force as the type of force then we have uh, sent words like revolves around my life revolves around uh, this and so on and so forth gravitate towards each other mechanical you can use this kind of word it uh, when i found out it hit me hard this is a mechanical force we are talking about natural force again he was swept off his feet deluged then magnetic drawn attracted repel irresistible so on and so forth. So, various kinds of emotional states um, or uh, the, the selves the, e the egos understanding of the uh, posi of his own position with respect to emotional um, atyachar basically can give rise to various beautiful uh, linguistic expressions. So, this is not only utilized in case of a simple uh, understanding of emotion, but also in terms of many other um, domains of you know uh, functions like talking about morality, talking about rational thought and so on and so forth. So, this is not only in terms of primary emotion uh, category of primary emotion, but also in terms of many other categories of uh, human understanding like morality. So, very often we use words like uh, uh, the resisting temptation. Uh, we often talk about politicians stooping too low and you know uh, fall for uh, a temptation and so on. Similarly, rational thought also uses this kind of various ways of looking at a scenario through the use of force dynamics. So, this is the basics uh, basic understanding of image schema in various domains of uh, various domains of um, experiential um, perceptual uh, interaction of the body and the environment and so on and how this actually looks like in language. In the next class, we will look at it more in a more detailed fashion with more examples from many other domains. Thank you.